Hello, my name is Lloyd Pate. I'm a clinical associate professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry. I've included my cell phone number and email address here so you can contact me if you have any questions about this presentation or any questions about patient care in general. Just give me a phone call or a text message or email and I'll be happy to try to help you out. And uh, you'll see a cougar staring back at you there on the slides. That is Shasta, the mascot at the University of Houston. So this talk isn't affiliated with the university in any way, as I say, an individual endeavor, but I like Shasta, so that's why her picture is there for us. So today's talk is on obesity and diabetes type two. This isn't an in-depth presentation. It's just a introductory talk uh, to hopefully get you studying and incorporating this into your practice. Two of the references that I use for preparing this uh, talk are shown here. There's a Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes 2018 by the American Diabetes Association and the um, Type 2 Diabetes Management Algorithm published as a joint endeavored by the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists and American College of Endocrinology. Those are available probably in medical libraries for you to study if you want to get a little bit more information about this subject. Or they're in depth more about how to treat diabetes. And so it's something that we really don't have to have but it doesn't hurt if you're interested to be familiar with the treatment of diabetes. So one of the conditions that I'd like to talk about today is metabolic syndrome. It's something that you've probably heard, but I'm not sure if everybody is real clear on what exactly metabolic syndrome is. And so that's why I wanted to talk about it because it's very closely related to diabetes and obesity. So what it is, is when a person has three or more of the following measurements, and you have the five criteria that are measured here. So the first one is a raised fasting blood sugar. And so that's a fasting glucose of 100 milligrams per deciliter or greater. Then you have increased triglycerides, and that's a triglyceride level of 150 milligrams per deciliter of, or greater. Then you have elevated blood pressure, and that's a systolic blood pressure of 130 or greater, or a diastolic blood pressure of 85 or greater. Then you have decreased HDL cholesterol. And so that's a level of 40 milligrams per deciliter, less than 40 milligrams per deciliter in men, or less than 50 milligrams per deciliter in women. Then you have waist circumference. And this measurement has two different uh, levels, one for Asians other than Japanese and uh, the rest of us. And so those measurements are waist circumference of greater than 40 inches in men or greater than 35 inches in women for the non-Asians. And for the Asians, it's greater than 35 inches in men and greater than 31 inches in women. There's a difference between Asians and Caucasians on the waist measurements because Asians tend to store the fat intra-abdominally instead of subcutaneously. And the intra-abdominal fat is the most dangerous type to have. And so that's why the uh, waist circumference is smaller for them. So the pathophysiology of diabetes is poorly understood. The best we can figure out right now is that you have a genetic predisposition towards diabetes, then environmental factors which cause you to express those genes. There's actually about 10% of the patients with type 2 diabetes who actually are doing everything right. They're thin, they eat right, they exercise, and yet because of their genetic predisposition, they still develop diabetes. But the 
basic underlying mechanism is a lack of endogenous insulin causing the hyperglycemia. And in type 2 diabetic patients, there's generally an underlying insulin resistance because of the obesity and the lack of exercise. Your body needs a higher level of insulin to get the same effect. And it seems like the continual need for the pancreas to overproduce insulin causes it to burn out and the beta cells lose the ability to produce the insulin needed and that then develop, uh, causes the patient to develop diabetes. Re new research is showing that maybe elevated free fatty acids can be a driving force behind the uh, insulin resistance and perhaps even beta cell dysfunction. There's uh, MRI studies that highly correlate pancreatic fat and liver fat to uh, insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction, dysfunction also. Diabetes can be divided in the following general categories. You have the type 1 diabetes. This is usually the younger patient, but you can have an adult onset which is an autoimmune disease causing the destruction of the beta cells, which usually causes an absolute insulin deficiency and the need for insulin injections. Then you have type 2 diabetes, which is a progressive loss of beta cell function, uh, leading to progressive uh, loss of insulin secretion. And that then will hit a threshold where the insulin production falls below what's needed for the body, and then you go into diabetes. Then you have the gestational diabetes, which is diagnosed in the second or third trimester of pregnancy in women who have not been diagnosed as a diabetic in the past. And you know, the term diabetic there is a slip from the old days. That term is uh, falling in disfavor we don't say diabetics now, we say patients with diabetes. Then you have a lot of other types of diabetes that can be caused by um, just things as infections or uh, genetics or inflammation or drugs. And so if you're really interested, there's a few of them, but we're not going to talk about any of those today. So Let's still talk about the criteria. When do you test somebody for diabetes or prediabetes in an asymptomatic adult? So the American Diabetes Association says testing should be considered in overweight or obese individuals and the BMIs are greater than 25 in uh, non-Asians and 23 in Asians. Adults, so you have an adult with a BMI greater than 25 for non-Asians, 23 in Asians, with one or more of the following risk factors. A first degree relative with diabetes, a high risk race, African American, Latino, Native American, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, history of cardiovascular disease, hypertension greater than 140 over 90, are on therapy for hypertension, an HDL cholesterol level of less than 35 milligrams per deciliter, or a triglyceride level of greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, physical activity, or other clinical conditions associated with insulin resistance like severe obesity or acanthosis nigricans. So those are the adults that should be tested if they have one or more of those risk factors in are obese. Then patients with prediabetes, an A1C of greater than equal or equal to 5.7% should be tested yearly. Women with gestational diabetes should have lifelong testing at least every three years. And then all, for all other patients with no risk factors, testing should begin at age 45. And if the initial results are normal, testing should be repeated at a minimum of three-year intervals with consideration given to the initial results and risk status. Then you have the criteria from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American College of Endocrinology. 
They say screen individuals with two or more risk factors annually. And you can see acanthosis nigricans greater than or equal to 45 years of age, any psychotic therapy for schizophrenia and or severe bipolar disease, cardiovascular disease or a family history of type 2 diabetes, chronic glucocorticoid exposure, HDL cholesterol level of less than 35, or triglyceride greater than 250, and again, a history of gestational diabetes or delivery of a baby weighing more than nine pounds, and hypertension greater than 140 over 90 or taking medications. And if you have normal initial test results, then they say that you should repeat it every three years. And uh, some of the other risk factors are impaired glucose tolerance, impaired gl fasting glucose, metabolic syndrome, member of an at-risk racial or ethnic group, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, overweight or obese, polycystic ovary syndrome, sedentary lifestyle, or sleep disorders in the presence of uh, glucose intolerance. So the criteria for being uh, making a diagnosis of prediabetes is a fasting uh, plasma glucose of 100 milligrams per deciliter to 125 milligrams per deciliter, or two-hour post-plasma uh, glucose during a 70-gram oral glucose tolerance test of 140 milligrams per deciliter to 190 milligrams per deciliter, or an A1C between 5.7 to 6.4. And uh, your increased risk your risk increase, the higher these numbers are. So the worse off your first tests are, then your risk of uh, developing diabetes goes up. So you want to make sure you stay at the low end of the range. And something to keep in mind, you saw that the pre-diabetes diagnosis was started at an A1C of 5.7, but you look here at a t one study that was done where the steepest increase in diabetic retinopathy prevalence occurs among individuals with an A1C of 5.5. And so that could help explain why 10% of the patients with diabetes have a diabetic retinopathy at the time of a diagnosis. So there's a little graph on the prevalence. So the criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes itself is a fasting plasma glucose of greater than or equal to 125 milligrams per deciliter. And fasting is defined as no uh, caloric intake for at least eight hours, or two hour uh, plasma glucose greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter during an oral glucose tolerance test. And so they have the criteria there for that. Or an A1C of greater than or equal to 6.5. An A1C should be done in a laboratory. The um, home tests, the ones you can do in your office, those aren't accurate enough to be considered uh, for the diagnosis. Or if you have a patient with the classic uh, symptoms of uh, diabetes and a random plasma glucose greater than or equal of uh, 200, that will meet the criteria for making a diagnosis of diabetes. So some diagnostic issues, once a patient's been tested, you want to try to repeat the testing at a later date with the same test. And if you do use two different tests and they conflict, then you go with the test that makes the diagnosis. The two-hour um, glucose tolerance test, um, two hour post uh, glucose tolerance test is the most likely to pick up diabetes. You pick up more diabetics with that than any other test. So you're 33% less likely to diagnose with an A1C, 
but since A1C is more practical and easier to do, you don't have to fast, maybe we'll go ahead and catch more people in the long run. And something to keep in mind is A1C values can be affected by different things like anemia, pregnancy, renal, liver disease, or anything that affects the red blood cell turnover rate. So let's look at one of the driving forces behind uh, 